In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> my Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. On this first Sunday of Lent, the first reading of the Mass taken from the book of Genesis recounts the story of Noah, that just man whom God chose as an instrument to what I normally call reset project mankind. Several Sundays ago, we were considering the reality of our divine filiation. God made man to his image and raised him up to his likeness with the indwelling of the blessed Trinity in the souls of Adam and Eve, such that they became sharers in the divine nature. However, Adam and Eve rejected that divine gift by transgressing a very simple command, giving into the temptation by the devil to be like God. Oh, what a tragedy. Because they were already like God. They had been made to his image, spiritual beings with intellect and free will, elevated to his likeness by the indwelling of the blessed Trinity in their soul in grace, such that they really could say, that they were children of God because they participated in his nature. But no, that was not the likeness of God that the devil tempted them with. The devil tempted them that they would be like God in the sense of supplanting him, determining good and evil in the sense that they would reestablish the laws of morality ethics according to their own liking. And brothers and sisters, isn't this what's behind every sin, every transgression of the eternal law of God, of the revealed law of God, the Ten Commandments? Behind every sin is this, shall we say, insane attempt of man to make himself the boss, to make himself the standard of morality. But at the end of the day, when you ask someone why he did something that was wrong, that he knew was wrong, and yet still he did it, the answer would be, because I wanted to, because I could. The consequence of that disorientation from God was the gradual deterior deterioration of the moral compass of the human race. Despite its rapid growth in numbers, and it spread on the surface of the earth, still following the divine command to go and multiply and subdue the earth. Nevertheless, they were getting more and more immoral, more and more unethical. Already in the second generation, the first two sons of Adam and Eve, Abel and Cain, we see the deterioration of that human nature because Cain slew his younger brother Abel out of envy and jealousy. Well, after the narration of the fall in chapter three of Genesis, chapters four and five summarize the first generations of mankind falling into increasing corruption until things come to a head in chapter six, which narrates the vocation of Noah, a just man who found favor with God among all the people there, he was the only one who was moral. Whom God commands to build an ark, a great ship to save his family and a large number of animals. Because a great flood was coming. And this is what we read in chapter 6 of Genesis. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth 
and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, as we begin Lent, let us reflect once more on the nature of sin and its effects on the spiritual creatures in general, on man in particular, and finally, the consequences of such sinfulness of man on the rest of the material universe because of his dominion over it. We were supposed to be the light for the rest of the material universe. But once we got disoriented, then the rest of the material universe somehow is affected negatively also. In the original plan of God, man, who shared in the divine nature by the indwelling of the blessed Trinity in his soul, was supposed to dispose of the material universe according to the natural law, which is intellect was capable of understanding as a participation in God's eternal law. Man was supposed to be the steward of the material universe. With man's disorientation from God, however, the internal harmony in man was likewise broken, such that the way he subdues the rest of the material creation has become abusive for the most part, choosing his own will over that of the creator. This is the immense malice of sin. The spiritual creatures, both angels and men, are the only ones who can freely transgress the will of God. While all the rest of creatures, both living and non-living, that vast universe that we have out there, inexorably follow the will of God. Both in their being, they have specific natures. There's a reason why we can study them scientifically. They're predictable, precisely because they don't have free will. They follow the will of God, both in their being and in their unfolding. <clears throat> the angels made their choice once and for all at the very moment of their creation. Those who chose to be identified with God remained angels, while those who rebelled, led by Satan, are the devils. For our part, man was given dominion over the material universe with the capacity to educe from it all its possibilities for the glory of God and the welfare of his fellow men and the rest of creation, or to abuse it and thereby introduce disorder in the universe. The proper attitude of man is reflected in the responsorial psalm that the congregation recites after the first reading of today's mass. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your path and teach me for you are God, my Savior. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Your ways, the ways of God, are love and truth. What a wonderful plan God had for Adam and Eve. In that original plan, after spending time in paradise, participating in the inner life of the Blessed Trinity, albeit still in time, they were supposed to just segue into eternal life, from being temporal to being eternal. But Adam and Eve sinned. And that initial disorientation towards God set them and their descendants on a course that slowly drifted farther from their creator. Chapters 4 and 6 of Genesis give a rough summary of this gradual drifting away from God, which ends in chapter seven and eight with the great flood 
that obliterates all living beings on the face of the planet, except those on Noah's Ark. Finally, the salvific will of God bursts forth in chapter 9, from which is taken the gospel reading of today's Mass. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the first covenant between God and man recorded in sacred scripture. Actually, it is an echo of another great revelation made by God on the very day of the fall of man in paradise. It was not a covenant because it was one way, meaning to say God promised something, committed himself to something, while Adam and Eve just remained silent, passive. Because on that day of their supposed banishment from paradise, God, in veiled words, had already announced his plan of salvation for them. In what was, in what is called the proto-evangelium, the proto-gospel, the first gospel, the first inkling of the good news when we read the lord god said to the serpent because you have done this cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. It made a vague reference to a woman and her seat. Careless reading would lead one to think that it was a reference to Eve and the snake, the serpent. But you know very well that no such enmity existed between Eve and the serpent. And definitely the offspring of Eve did not crush the head of the serpent. I suppose Moses, to whom this revelation was made and who wrote precisely, who put down the Pentateuch, the first five books, including Genesis, these words still remain veiled, relatively obscure. It would be thousands of years later when this would be fulfilled. When Mary would bear a son and would call him Jesus, which in Hebrew means savior, because he would redeem mankind from that original sin and their own sins through his passion, death, and resurrection. Dei perfecta sunt opera. The works of God are perfect. Project Mankind was perfectly thought out. Foreseeing man's fall, our own sinfulness, God also provided the cure. However, he had to respect his own creation and its nature. Since he had made man free, he could not manipulate him, neither before nor after the fall, to save him. Thus, human history with all its twists and turns, is really the history of salvation. It's the history of divine providence guiding man towards reconciliation with God, but always respecting human freedom. There's a line of study which is called the philosophy of history. Not the history of philosophy, which is the history of thought history of philosophers and, and their thinking, but rather the philosophy of history. 
What is the logic of history? What is the plan of history? The polyatheists think that history is moved forward by some game of the gods. That's why you read in the, the Song of the Nibelungs, no? what God, whom God wished to destroy, he first makes mad. We're just pawns in a game of the gods. That's not true, as you know very well. Others would think that history is moved forward because mo every now and then some megalomaniac like, I don't know, Julius Caesar or a Napoleon Bonaparte or a Genghis Khan before him would come around and change the course of history. Not even the rise of great saints like Saint Peter and Paul or Saint John Paul II really explain history. Those luminaries of human history are just instruments of a much greater mind with a plan to repair the colossal damage done by sin on human history. Human history and its material environment. And this is the salvific will of God. And there's a reason why human history is really the history of salvation, salvation history. This is what Peter tells us in the second reading of today's Mass. When we read, Beloved, Christ suffered for sin since once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that he might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, he was brought to life in the spirit. In it, he also went to preach to the spirits in prison who had once been disobedient while God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few persons, eight in all, were saved through water. This then is the human condition. Made in God's image, elevated to God's likeness by the gift of the Holy Spirit, fallen to sin through the temptation of the devil, redeemed by the passion, death, and resurrection of the Son of God made man, and yet remaining free to negotiate his own time in history and freely determine his trajectory in eternity. Our life on earth is our time for choosing our eternal destiny. While we're in this side of the grave, we're subject to both God's inspirations to fulfill our divine filiation and the devil's temptations to transgress that eternal will in order to do our own. And that is what sin is. And this is what today's gospel reading brings to our consideration. The spirit we read immediately drove him, that's our Lord, right after baptism into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast and the angels ministered to him. Right after his baptism in the Jordan, our Lord was led to the wilderness by the spirit, the Judean wilderness, where he prayed and fasted for 40 days while being tested by the devil. This is what the Latin tentatio really means a test, a trial, much the same way that you subject a certain product, for example, to quality testing, or you subject the graduates or the students of university to a test, not to flunk them. The purpose of a trial or a test is not to cause the demise of a product or the demise of a person. On the contrary, it's supposed to bring out the best in them. Well, that's the meaning of tentatio, of temptation. It's not really a temptation to sin, strictly speaking, but a test of our moral uprightness, a test of our moral integrity, a test in the final analysis of our conviction to follow the will of God. 
while our Lord was tempted. In a manner of speaking, he could not really contradict himself. So that's not an actual temptation as we normally understand the word. But yes, it was a test because the devil subjected him to a series of what, what we, may, we may call indecent proposals. He allowed himself to be tempted. He allowed himself to be subjected to that insult of the devil in order to give us an example of how or what we're supposed to do when we ourselves are tempted. He rejected the temptations. Without any dialogue, without any second thoughts or second glances. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Only from the perspective of God's perfect plan for man can one understand the passion and death of the Son of God made man. Because Project Mankind cannot be a losing proposition. Otherwise, the Blessed Trinity would never even have embarked on it. Man's sin cannot be the last word. God's love has the last word. In history, that word is continuously being revealed in scripture, in the life of the church, and that's what we call tradition, and in the intimacy of the prayer of every man and woman. It is the unfolding of salvation history. My brothers and sisters, may this Lenten season be a meaningful episode in that history for each one of us. It will be if you don't if you do not let it pass like water on rocks. And this is the final word of Jesus Christ in today's gospel reading. After John had been arrested, we read Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment, he said. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. Go to the sacrament of reconciliation and devote more time to prayerful meditation. God is willing to forgive. Man just has to be repentant and turn back to him. We can end this meditation with some words from the Lenten message of Pope Francis delivered last February 12th. In our Lenten journey towards Easter, he said, let us remember the one who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. During this season of conversion, let us renew our faith, draw from the living water of hope and receive with open hearts the love of God who makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. At the Easter vigil, we will renew our baptismal promises and experience rebirth as new men and women by the working of the Holy Spirit. This Lenten journey, like the entire pilgrimage of the Christian life, is even now illumined by the light of the resurrection, which inspires the thoughts, attitudes, and decisions of the followers of Christ. You have five or six minutes left in this prayer to make your own considerations and formulate your resolutions.